in five. Okay, with that, I'd like to call the uh, September 2024 ZBA meeting to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Matt Kaiser. Present. Richard Brooks. Here. Anthony Jones. Here. Brad Fredette. Present. Ken Hilton. Present. All right, so the first order of business will be to appoint Mr. Well, appoint Mr. Jones and Mr. Hilton as vote, full voting members. Second order of business will be the approval of minutes of the August 7th, 2024 meeting. What's the wish of the board? Mr. Fredette? Make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. A motion, do we have a second? Second by Mr. Hilton. Any, any further comment on the, mo the minutes? All those in favor of approving the August 7th, 2024 meetings, raise your right hand. This is 5-0. Move on to old business, 2A. Steve Klaus is seeking a variance from table 5.8.1 to construct a fifth unit in a existing building on a property located at 16 Walnut Street in the residential multifamily R3 district. Assessors map 08, lot 06, 106, excuse me, ZBA case 105, 2024. There is a public hearing. Ms. Crosley. All right. So as mentioned, the applicant is seeking to add a fifth unit to an existing four unit structure. The proposal is to split one of the existing two bedroom units into two one bedroom units for a total of five units, five one bedroom units. Um, multifamily use is a permitted use in the R3 district. The existing lot size is 19,166.4 square feet with 149 feet of frontage. For properties over three units, the required lot size increases based on the number of bedrooms per unit. So to convert the existing four unit, which is three one bedroom units and one two bedroom unit to a five unit of five one bedroom units, the following lot size is required. Um, the minimum lot size plus 4,000 square feet plus times two, which is 34,250 square feet, where obviously this lot does not meet that requirement. If a variance is granted, this application would go through the at least minor site plan process. Um, and they have received a number of variances historically for this property. They also have received site plan approval in 1985. Um, they had a variance at one time to operate a kindergarten, which has ceased to operate at that facility. Um, they received a variance to have a barber shop in the basement, which has also ceased operation. Um, they received a variance to convert the duplex to a triplex without the required frontage, setback requirements, lot size, and parking spaces, and that was approved. The most recent variance that they received was in 2004, which they received a variance from Table 5, Section, section 5, Table 5A1, for relief from the minimum lot size requirement to com convert the commercial unit into residential unit, which was approved. This created the fourth unit at the property. So they have addressed the five variance criteria so the board can take action on the application. Okay. Any questions for Ms. Crosley? Seeing none, the applicant state come forward, state your name, and present why we should grant the variance. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, members of the board. Brett Allard with Shaughnessy Allard. I am the attorney for the owner of this property, Walnut Street 16 LLC. And joined with me tonight, uh, behind me to my right, is Steve Walls, uh, uh, our client's property manager. I have uh, two housekeeping items before I dive into the application. Um, one is that I did bring um, uh, handouts of uh, a screenshot of the property. Uh, and also a tax map overlay. Um, if anyone's interested in either of those, I can pass those out for orientation and reference because for an application like this, we didn't necessarily submit a site plan or anything since we're asking for internal reconfiguration and no external changes on the site, but I thought it would be helpful to have something in case uh, folks want to see it. Um, the second is I just learned very recently uh, and I want to clarify on the record in terms of the bedrooms within the number of units. Um, there is only four units in there. We're asking for a variance for the fifth unit. Um, but um, I think we got our wires crossed in terms of the bedrooms per unit. Um, the actual existing bedrooms are there's a one bedroom, 
a three bedroom and two two bedrooms and it's the three bedroom that we're proposing to partition to create the um, uh, the extra unit so that three bedroom would become a two bedroom and a one bedroom um, so that's eight bedrooms total and we're still proposing eight bedrooms total rather than five and then remaining five which I think is what it said in the application so I'd wanted to correct that on the record but still only adding one unit and not adding any bedrooms can you repeat that one more time the bedrooms for each unit yep what yep. you have and then what it's gonna be there's currently a three bedroom two two bedrooms and a one bedroom okay. and it's that three bedroom that would be partitioned to create the fifth unit so that three bedroom would become a two bedroom and a one bedroom but as I said um, four units existing five proposed and still not increasing um, any bedrooms in terms of the total bedroom count um, so those are the two things I wanted to uh, just clarify before I dove into um, uh, our presentation uh, on the application so um, this is 16 Walnut Street tax map 8 lot 106 uh, the property is in the R3 multifamily zone um, and it sits right there on the border of the uh, business zone it's about uh, just under a half acre 0.44 acres um, it, it has an existing uh, it's an existing four unit multifamily dwelling as the board just heard uh, there is a large parking area um, if you've been out to the site or driven by you've probably noticed um, and there's also a uh, on if you're facing it from the street big parking area on the left there's also on the right side of the building a long driveway uh, with two parking spaces and a garage in the back so there's a good amount of parking out there um, there's also a sizable backyard um, and, some, and some open space um, you heard uh, about you know what we're here asking for which is essentially a variance uh, to, uh, a density variance um, to allow for um, an extra unit on here where there's this is already um, a pre-existing non-conforming um, building as it relates to um, the existing density and we are proposing to create a fifth unit in what was formerly I was told it was a daycare kindergarten um, I wasn't aware of the barbershop or the other uh, commercial uses down there um, but yeah this 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 property does sort of have a, an interesting uh, history in terms of uh, it's, it's sort of mixed-use nature but uh, moving forward uh, my client anticipates that will remain residential uh, and and that's the intent of the application tonight um, again it's going to be internal reconfiguration only uh, we're not proposing any external redevelopment other than possibly well we are going to have to add a new egress for the new unit but um, not expanding the footprint of the building or anything like that so um, really a density variance at its core um, and that's all I have for um, background information before I dive into the criteria so um, granting the variance will not be contrary to the public interest and will be consistent with the spirit of the ordinance uh, the Supreme Court's held that these criteria are related so for purposes of brevity I'll address them together um, for a variance to be contrary to the public interest the proposal has to conflict with the ordinance so much that it violates basic zoning objectives and the relevant tests are whether um, the uh, essential character of the neighborhood will be changed or whether it will threaten public health safety or welfare and here we don't see any alteration to the essential character of the area multifamily uh, uses are um, allowed and encouraged in this zone and we're going to stay consistent with that uh, and in fact if you look uh, in the immediate vicinity here you have an abutting property 20 Walnut Street they have six units with eight bedrooms um, again we're proposing five units with eight bedrooms and then you have seven dash nine walnut um, across the street they have three units with six bedrooms so fairly consistent with the immediate uh, character of the area um, so you know based on no external reconfiguration uh, no external changes the character of the neighborhood's not going to be changed in terms of parking that's largely driven by um, total bedroom count and we're not increasing the number of bedrooms so we don't think we're increasing the parking demand uh, there is sufficient parking out there right now for the number of bedrooms uh, that we have uh, and there will be sufficient parking no increase in that demand for um, what we're proposing because we're not increasing the bedrooms um, the existing dwelling um, or the existing um, three bedroom that's going to be converted to a one bedroom you're not going to have drastically more people in there because again the amount of people you have in there is largely driven by bedroom count and we're not changing the number of bedrooms even though we are adding an additional unit so we don't see any overcrowding or congestion which is the main purpose of density requirements um, and we don't see any threat to the public health or safety 
Number three, granting the variance would do substantial justice. Uh, as this board knows, that's a balancing test between public and private rights. Uh, we don't see any injury to the public if the variance is granted, nor gain to the public if the variance is denied. Uh, given the multifamily nature of the area uh, and existing conditions of the property, we think granting the variance uh, for the would be appropriate for the area, uh, particularly to add another unit to the city's housing stock and granting variances that are appropriate for the area does substantial justice. So we think when you weigh uh, the public and private rights, they lean in favor of granting the variance. Number four, the values of surrounding properties will not be diminished. We think the proposal is in harmony with the neighborhood. Again, no external changes on the property for visual changes or anything like that that could affect surrounding properties. Not seeking to build or change the footprint. Not going into any setbacks such that surrounding property values could potentially be compromised. Again, be bedroom counts staying the same. Parking demands are staying the same. So we don't see any measurable increase in noise or traffic or anything like that. Um, we do have that sufficient parking, so no um, congestion, and uh, we are sticking with that multifamily use, which the zone encourages uh, and is permitted by right. So we think this is a, um, a good site for this sort of thing, particularly given the existing building, uh, and we don't think the values of surrounding properties will be diminished. Number five, unnecessary hardship. Uh, as the board knows, the uh, first step in the analysis is to address the special conditions of the property, of which we think this uh, site has many. Um, it's an existing multifamily building, again, with an interesting sort of uh, back history, as you heard. Sit and the, the, the building is situated actually entirely, uh, for the most part, on the northwesterly corner. So that's what allows you to have that sizable parking area uh, and a good amount of open space in terms of a backyard uh, sufficient to support uh, the existing number of units uh, in an additional unit. Um, I think the area that this, um, the area of the building where we're proposing to partition to create the two units is the portion of the building that used to be the daycare or the kindergarten, uh, and there is sufficient ample space in there in order to create that additional unit. It is the biggest unit in the building. Um, and the site is situated near uh, many other multifamily uses, as I described. Uh, many of them are more intense than, than what we're proposing, and we're also situated right on the edge of the business zone, which, of course, has sort of higher intensity commercial uses um, right in the area. So we think this is a uniquely situated lot in terms of its ability to support this sort of proposal. So owing to those special conditions, we don't see a fair or substantial relationship between the purpose and application of the density requirements here. Um, the lot's going to remain consistent with the intensity of surrounding uses. Again, project is strictly limited to interior reconfiguration, um, sufficient parking, no congestion. Um, and so, you know, based on all of that and for all the reasons I've really said, um, we think notwithstanding the strict application of the ordinance, um, this property is particularly well suited for this proposal. Um, and for all those reasons, would submit that the proposed use is reasonable. I uh, would ask that the board grant the variance and be happy to answer any questions. Okay. So the process is, uh, first we'll have, ask you to step down, or step back, not down, sorry. Um, and see if anyone else wants to speak, either for or against, and then we'll ask you back up, have you come back up and we'll ask you some questions. Thank you. Okay. So would anybody like to speak either for or against or on this topic? Seeing none, come on right back up. Maybe a formality sometimes. <laughs> uh, questions for the applicant. We debate our questions. So I, I got a question for you. So you say that uh, the same number of bedrooms would be, if you have the same eight bedrooms, no matter how many apartments, you'd have the same number of adults. I would think that each apartment would have at least one adult, if not two adults. And so if you increase the number of apartments, you potentially increase the number of adults and therefore number of vehicles. Agree, disagree? Um. 50-50, because you could have a kid's bedroom and an adult bedroom, or maybe it could be roommates who are both adults. Um, I think that would be, you know, if you have if you had two couples living together in a two-bedroom, then you're going to have two cars. But if you have a family with two adults and one child, then you're probably only going to have maybe one or two cars. So it's hard to speculate. But plausible, I see what you're saying. Okay. Mr. Brooks. We often find the hardships the hardest thing to um, satisfy on the different you know criteria here. Um, you know, I, obviously there's a lot of similar stuff around it, but that doesn't really relate to 
a hardship in your case necessarily. It does make it a bit unique maybe, but we find that a lot of areas around Summersworth has been developed pre-zoning, so a lot of them are non-conforming already just as this property is as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess could you expand on that hardship criteria? Is that, again, that seems to be the hardest thing to meet sure. with most any variants. Uh, yeah, it definitely is. Um, oh, so the hardship analysis is sort of a multi-pronged test, um, and it starts by saying, owing to the special conditions of the property. So what are the special conditions of the property? You know, here we have a, a, a large house um, that has a three-bedroom uh, unit in it. It's situated all the way sort of in the corner of the lot, which in that way, notwithstanding sort of any setback or dimensional nonconformities, does allow for a substantial parking area. Um, and uh, when you're talking about uh, variances for density, um, and that's, this goes into the second piece of, of the equation, owing to the special conditions of the property, there's no fair and substantial relation between the purpose of the application of the requirement and its, its waiver here. Um, the purpose of a density requirement is really to make sure that properties aren't overbuilt in a way that can't be supported such that it spills over it impacts the neighborhood there's congestion there's overcrowding etc if a property is uh, is sort of unique in a way where that issue is not going to arise if the variance is granted because there's some special conditions that aren't going to manifest that adverse situation then you have a hardship um, and you know i think our position here is that there's already eight bedrooms. There's going to remain eight bedrooms. Um, parking counts, just like you know, when you're dealing with this is on water and sewer. But when you're dealing with septic and it's talking about capacity, that's the state does regulates those largely on bedroom counts because that's the best way to measure the uh, person, the people density of, of the lot. Um, so we're not, because because we do have a unique situation where the structure is large enough to support a second unit. We can do it by partitioning one unit in a way that doesn't add any bedrooms on a lot that's uniquely situated in terms of its, where its parking area is, where the driveway is, and where the building is, so that it can support everyone. You know, And, and because of those conditions, there's not going to be overcrowding, congestion, unsupportability of the lot. When you take all of that together, you know, we think that shows that the hardship criteria is satisfied. Ms. Crosley, does the the distribution of the bedrooms or the number of the apartments does that change the square footage requirements? Does that change anything on regular variance request? Is it still is this the requirement still uh, thirty four thousand two thirty four thousand square feet? Yes, because yes. we'd use the first, so they get three freebies basically if they're meeting the minimum lot to meet the minimum lot size, and then the additional. Um, intensity so the three two bedroom units would be required to meet the minimum lot size and then adding one bedroom units we're increasing density okay so won't affect it okay just want to make sure all right other questions for the applicant okay final comments by the applicant I don't believe so thank you for your time okay, thank you very much with that I'll close the public hearing discussion with the board first order of business will be regional impact does anyone see there be a regional impact Mr. Hilton? I move that the variance request of Stephen Claus does not have potential for regional impact. We have a motion that does not. Do we have a second? Mr. Brooks seconds it. Any discussion on the motion? The motion is that it does not have regional impact. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Passes 5 0. Discussion on the variance. Mr. Fredette. Not sure where Mr. Brooks is going to fall, but based off of his comments and some of his questions, I'm going to draw my own conclusion that I think the hardship criteria here is not satisfied. And I think we have to be very specific when we're looking at doing conversion additional units in multis that we don't create a precedent that is used later on. I don't see a substantial loss to the property owner with the property being used the way it is now versus the way it's going to be used in the future. Okay. For a discussion. Um, Mr. Hilton? On this um, 
One of the challenges these days um, for apartments, especially a three bedroom apartment, is there aren't as many people renting the bigger apartments. Um, I always thought it was, a, when I was, whenever I had property, I always thought it was a good thing to have bigger apartments because of, of families. But nowadays, it's more of a challenge to rent those. So you could say that that is a hardship. Might be stretching it, <laughs> but um, you're not increasing the bedrooms. Um, and the town is always, or the city is um, talking about all the time about needing more housing. This would be another one bedroom um, apartment in the city. So I tend to lean that direction. Okay. Mr. Jones. I think 99% of the time when we see variances for uh, additional density in the R3 zone, it's kind of all the same things. It's frontage we don't meet, lot size we don't meet, and uh, parking requirements we don't meet. And I, I think owing to what the applicant said, that usually is an issue because the, everything was built out predating the zoning. Um, when we look at the expansion of use, obviously we want to try and meet the zoning. And I think here, where this uniquely does have the parking area and they're, they have the front edge, it's just the lot size that they're looking for the relief on. Um, I think kind of taking all that together as council kind of described that hardship criteria, I believe it is met. Okay. Mr. Brooks? <clears throat> I'm really on the fence with this one. I'm, you know, the applicant does bring up some very good points to it, um, how it doesn't impact surrounding areas, especially. Um, you know, I, a lot of times we want to see a hardship that impacts it somehow, and I don't see that. You know, like obvious, you know, just most obvious being if you've got such a small area, you know, you can't build kind of thing. But in this case, you know, it is seems to make a lot more sense and it doesn't impact stuff as much as others where they're you know typically adding on and having add in more parking this seems to have a lot of that stuff in place where it's not overcrowding through the process it seems to be already well suited for that additional units that he's requesting so I oddly find myself probably willing to support this one okay yeah, I'm, I'm, I understand what you're saying. I, saw, I see that it meets, or I, I don't find that it does not meet the other four criteria. I find that it meets the other four criteria. It's, again, the hardship criteria. Is the, a property unique such that the uniqueness of it makes it so that the, the density, because we're really talking about the density. So what is, it, what is unique about this property such that it should not have to meet the density requirements? It's the fact that it has, it's the size, so it, the property, it's, how do I want to put this? The property is sized, or the requirements, the requirements are sized for a certain, certain density. And here we're going less than that. So I always try to think of, okay, so what makes it okay? What is it that makes it okay that we, sh we can allow it to be less square footage or the, 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 the lot size to be less? Is parking enough? Is the fact that, it, that what does the building mean on the one corner of the lot, how does that affect it? Allows us allow more room for, let's say, children to play or people to, to socialize. You know, what's the purpose of the density requirements? Um, it, it's tough. Um, though I'm, I'm not so. Is parking enough of a? Is is the fact that it has enough parking unique enough, and the building being large unique enough to allow to say that um, it's unnecessary burden that it should have more apartments, um, up for should have five apartments versus the city's plan or the, the ordinance requirement to, to really restrict it to three, it's grandfathered for four. So it's really jumping from, th you know, the requirement is only for three, it's already jumping up to five. So it's kind of jumping up there. So I don't see myself supporting this. I don't see that the, the applicant has not demonstrated enough that there's, a, there's enough uniques to the property that, it, that it's unnecessary heart burdened by it. Mr. Fredette, is it? I have to agree. And it's, again, it's functioned as a four unit. It's producing income as a four unit. We don't have a property here that can't be 
that the zoning ordinance is restricting it to a point that it can't function in a reasonable and modern manner. Mr. Hilton? I, I would tend to lean the other direction because for one one of the biggest reasons, like Mr. Brooks said, was or Mr. Jones said, is that you're not changing the outside. None of the dimensions on the outside, you have the parking, you have the same number of bedrooms, um, and the marketplace has changed. Uh, so I would say, in my opinion, that would, uh, I would lean that direction to giving them the variance, because he could have done it just on the sly. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hilton, I, I, I wish you wouldn't keep bringing that up. I know, <laughs> but I'm telling you, he, <laughs> he, he, he's coming it. before us trying to get a variance, trying to do it the right way. And so I would lean that direction that we would give it, um, that this would be, uh, that he has met enough of the criteria and that that one uh, square footage of the lot uh, is a, is a hardship okay. so mm -hmm. Mr. Jones I guess just to close that out and ignoring about 50% of what mr. Hilton said um, having all the other amenities on the property I think is a huge unique benefit that a lot of the properties in the R3 zone that come for this exact variance don't have and I think that is definitely worth something okay. Okay. for a discussion if not we'll entertain a motion Mr. Brooks. After review of the application, the file, and all the information presented to the board, I feel that all five criteria have been satisfied for the reasons discussed here tonight, and I move that the request for Steve Klaus for a variance from Table 5.A.1 to construct a fifth unit in the existing building on a property located at 16 Walnut Street be granted. Okay, we have a motion to have a second. Second by Mr. Jones. Discussion on the motion. Okay, the motion is to grant the variance for a fifth unit. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Those opposed, passes five, three to two, so the variance is granted. All right, any other old business to come before the board? Ms. Crosley? No old business. Any old business from board members? Seeing none, we'll move on to new business. Item 3 al Alpha, New England Sports Hub and Event Center LLC is seeking an equitable waiver to allow three HVAC systems within the rear setback on a property located at six, six, excuse me, Will and Drive, slow down, in the commercial slash industrial CI district. Assessors map 63, lot 10-1, ZBA case 12, 2024. There is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Ms. Crosley. Okay. Um, so, like you mentioned, the applicant is seeking an equitable waiver for three HVAC units to remain within the 30-foot rear setback. The HVAC, HVAC um, units, excuse me, um, encroach between 6.56 to 6.75 feet into the setback. Um, they are considered a structure based off of our definition of a structure. This development um, was approved by the planning board in 2021 to create a it was a two lot subdivision this portion of the lot was subdivided off the hilltop fun center and um they got a site plan approval for an athletic fitness facility um, and infrastructure they have addressed the number of criteria for there's four there's two ones um Four items for equitable waiver. It's a little different than the applications you typically see before you, but um, they have addressed it, so the board can take action on this tonight. Okay. Questions for Ms. Crosley? Seeing none, please state your name. Uh, please already come forward. Please state your name and why we should grant this equitable waiver. Thank you very much. My name is Philip Hastings, um, an attorney with Cleveland Waters and Bass, uh, with offices in Concord and Dover. Um, I represent uh, the applicant tonight, uh, who also is here, Craig Riotto, uh, and Jeff Oliva, uh, our engineer. I do have some handouts. I'm not sure what you have in your package. Uh, what do you have? You want to hand them out? We have. The, I think we have those. But if you want to hand them out, feel free. Take one. Pass those along. I also have 
just an overview of the pre-construction view just to help orient folks. Yeah, I think we have, yeah, we have that, so. You like to the paper, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just like, as, uh, as uh, Ms. Crosley indicated, uh, this is something of an unusual uh, request. It's an unusual situation. I've been practicing for 31 years now. This is doing primarily this stuff. This is my first uh, hearing on an equitable waiver request under the statute, uh, which so I just have not seen these well, situations. One up on you. This before, is probably so. our second. So. Uh, <laughs> um, so we are here because we've had uh, a, a situation develop regarding these three uh, rather large HVAC units, uh, which service a rather large building, uh, rather large structure. Um, uh, the staff uh, determined that the three HVAC units were installed uh, within the rear yard uh, requirement. Um, of the sports dome. It's a 30 uh, foot rear yard requirement. Uh, as installed, uh, the HVAC units, um, they encroach about six and a half feet into the, the uh, rear yard. Um, I think the, the staff determination on this was erroneous and it indicated that they encroached uh, up to six feet of the property line, but the encroachment is really only six feet into the setback. They're over 23 feet from the property line itself. Uh, each encroachment actually takes up an area of uh, only about 77 square feet. One is 76 square feet, one 78 square feet. So if you're, if you're looking at the amount of the encroachment into the setback, it's very minor. Uh, each one individually are less than the 120 square feet, which the ordinance has sort of a de minimis uh, requirement about. Um, um, the units are located on concrete pads uh, that were part of the original uh, site plan um, as it's been developed. Those concrete pads themselves are not uh, considered uh, encroaching into the uh, rear yard area. Uh, there's a paved drive aisle between this property uh, and the adjacent property around the building. Uh, that too is not part of the, considered part of the rear yard setback area. There are bioretention facilities within that area. Uh, what I'm trying to point out is there's a lot going on behind this building. Uh, that is not um, uh, uh, inconsistent with having these HVAC units. The other important feature of the HVAC units themselves is that uh, most of the six feet, a fair amount of the, Jeff, maybe you can correct me here, uh, but the HVAC units overhang into the encroachment. So some of the encroachment is the, the HVAC units themselves, but then there's the overhanging vent, uh, if you will. And I think there's a picture in your package that shows that overhang. Um, um, so uh, despite uh, this, uh, the staff, um, uh, advised the applicant to seek an equitable waiver. Um, I believe this is exactly the type of situation that the statute was created for. It's a situation that was uh, made in good faith. Uh, it was discovered uh, that uh, there is arguably an inconsistency uh, in the, between what was built and what the ordinance has been interpreted by staff as. I think the ordinance itself is a little bit unclear about this. Um, excuse me, this is not a true setback requirement. Your ordinance refers to maintaining an open space uh, within that 30 foot uh, rear yard area. Uh, it doesn't sp specify that no structures can be there and the fact that there are other types of facilities within that area. Uh, you know, create some ambiguity 
in uh, interpretation. Um, I have addressed the four criteria in the written material that you have. Um, I'll go through those briefly and we'll be happy to answer questions about those. Uh, the first criteria uh, is uh, whether this is a after the fact uh, situation. Uh, the ordinance requires that the alleged violation was not discovered until the structure has been substantially completed. That's exactly the case here. Uh, as the construction process was unfolding for this project, uh, the applicant had no reason to believe that they would be considered a structure or that they would not meet the requirements of the zoning ordinance. Um, they were installed uh, to respond to uh, field conditions as it developed and the inability to uh, acquire other structures timely. So um, Greg or Jeff could speak to that if you're interested, but it was a, uh, a situation that happens frequently in the construction business uh, where substitutions are made on, on the fly and there was, no, uh, there was no reason to think that this particular substitution of the HVAC units would cause any problems. Um, the second criteria is uh, whether, essentially whether uh, the action was done in bad faith or with some willful uh, act on behalf of the applicant. Uh, that's not the case here. Um, the applicant has acted in good faith uh, throughout this entire process. Uh, when it was discovered, we've been working diligently with the city uh, to resolve this. That resulted in the city instructing us to come before you. Uh, so we are not, as Mr. Hilton said in the prior case, acting on the sly, uh, we're trying to do the right thing here and uh, resolve an issue uh, that's arisen through no fault of our own. Um, uh, as I noted, uh, the ordinance is not entirely clear on this issue, um, or the ordinance does not prohibit structures per se. Um, and in fact, it doesn't really define what uh, is in the, what can and can't be in the yard area uh, with any uh, specificity at all. Um, several improvements are allowed per the approved site plan uh, all around this building, in the front uh, yard, in the rear yard, in the side yard. This paved parking area is allowed. Uh, there are drive aisles allowed. Uh, there are bioretention and stormwater treatment facilities allowed within the setbacks. There's utility equipment. Uh, there's a security gate. There's many features uh, that are arguably uh, structures and arguably more invasive into the setbacks than these HVAC units. Um, in this context, it uh, was not unreasonable for the applicant uh, to consider these units perfectly acceptable um, and uh, permissible under the terms of the zoning ordinance. The third criteria is whether the uh, alleged violation constitutes a nuisance or uh, reduces the value of any other property uh, or interferes with the use of any other property. I think you can see from the uh, photo that I handed out of the overview, the only impacted property, uh, potentially impacted property, is the uh, Army National Guard site uh, behind this building. It's already in industrial use. These HVAC units, as they're located, will have no impact uh, visually, aesthetically, or from property values on this. There is. There remains something of a tree uh, line between the two buildings. Again, you've got paved area between them, you've got the concrete pads, and you've got the building. So having a, uh, in each instance, an encroachment of uh, 77 square feet encroachment will have no interference on that property. It will not interfere with the value of the property. Uh, it's not a nuisance in any way. In fact, um, the HVAC units are necessary so that this building can function 
properly. Um, they're not unsightly or dangerous in any way either. And then finally, um, there's an equitable, hence the name an equitable waiver, there's an equitable component uh, in the statute uh, about whether the cost of correcting um, the situation uh, relative to any public benefit. Uh, and here, the cost of uh, potentially removing these HVAC systems, relocating them, reconfiguring them in some way would uh, cost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to remedy it for no public benefit whatsoever. Um, there, there's no gain to be had from the public uh, by uh, denying this equitable waiver. And for that reason, we'd ask that you grant it. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll ask to see if anyone else wants to come up and speak. Anyone else like to come up and speak, either for or against? Would we have a chance to respond if there's questions? If we have questions and you, you have the answer versus him, versus your attorney, absolutely. We'll, Which you'll is be able, likely? You'll, we'll, <laughs> most certainly we'll have you come up, absolutely. Okay. Yep, we want the right. We want the right answer. We don't want the guess. <laughs> All right, so we'll come on right back up, and uh, we'll open it up to questions from the board. Mr. Jones, then followed by Mr. Brooks. Um, I have kind of two questions. One, um, you wrote in the background a request for relief that neither the concrete pad itself nor the paved surface extending the length of the building are considered violations of the Yard Step Act. So the concrete pad wasn't considered a structure until after. The concrete pad itself is still the city does not consider that a structure, a structure in any in any way okay uh, um, or at least for purposes of the the yard the yard setback. requirement yep um, and then I guess just extremely briefly kind of what was the timeline to get here you uh, were at the planning board got an approval there then you went to build there was a field change was the HVAC equipment shown on the original approved site plan Jeff and Craig do you want to take that the state your name uh, Jeff Oliva, civil consultants, uh, we're the engineers that worked on the site plan for this project. So when this project started, came in front of the board, it was 2021, mm -hmm. right in the middle of COVID. Um, we received site plan approval, and then in the time in between from 2021 approval, getting everything organized, finishing up design work and getting to where um, construction started, the equipment that we had originally thought was going to be used was discontinued, and we had to go to a different, there was a different um, mechanical size picked for this project. Okay. It was shown on the plans at that time. Um, one of the things that we also did is that we also added um, on, you'll see in the application, there are three pieces of equipment that are in that setback. Uh, our original approval had two. Uh, during the, that design process from planning board approval until construction started, we added that third unit for additional uh, safety precautions. Um, on that pad that's outside the setback, there's also uh, additional emergency generators to be able to uh, make sure that we can provide power and um, the, the, the air pressure needed to maintain the dome um, if there's a power outage. And that third piece of equipment uh, gives us that opportunity to have a, more of a redundant situation uh, on the project. But it was more of a situation of what happened from when the initial design started to when the equipment dropped on site was larger than uh, what, what was originally intended, mm -hmm. primarily because of the COVID changes and things with the um, equipment not being available. So the original um, approved plan showed a, a smaller pad, a smaller it's HVAC unit, and it was inside, the entirety was inside that. The, the pads were showing on the site plan, they were just shown straddling that, that 30 line. 30-foot line? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then when the difference in dimension was made aware, when everything was dropped on site, I assume there was a process to go back to the, the city to amend? Yeah, and that, that's what our process um, will be doing next, is we've been working, um, I've been working with uh, uh, Dana and Michelle in town office. So after, um, if th this is granted, then we're going to update our plan, and then we've got a minor field modification site plan that will be presented to show 
to, to quantify these three HVAC equipment that impact and then also to show um, what we also did in, in order to provide additional safety for the public. We've added more doors around the perimeter. We've um, increased the entry size to be able to provide more um, access, mm -hmm. exit, egress. So that all that part will be shown on one plan that indicates the field, minor field changes. Okay, and then this might be thrown back to council, but um, that kind of brings us to where we are. Um, the issue of that the, the bigger pad doesn't comply, wasn't made known at the time that... The unit, not the pad. The unit. The unit. The bigger unit not complying or being defined as part of the structure was not made aware until after it was delivered, installed on site, right. and we, you started the process of amending the site plan drawings. Correct. Okay. I think I got it. <laughs> I'm good. Mr. Brooks. <clears throat> well, he asked a couple of my questions, but I guess who first noticed this? Was it... A surveyor? Was it one of the workers? I mean, how did it come about? Okay, Greg. So it was a. Um, Please state your name. Greg Riato, president of New England Sports Hub. Yep. Uh, it was actually the city planner. Michelle Mears was doing a site visit and she noticed that, you know, these don't look exactly like what's depicted on the site plan. Uh, she brought that to our attention and within, I think, of, I mean, I. Yeah, with, with from ownership learning about the uh, the condition and, and the observation made by the city planner, immediately contacted Jeff, you know, to make sure we were responding accordingly. And Jeff set up a meeting with the city planner to begin reviewing it within, I thought it was a week, but it sounds like yeah. just a couple of days. And that's basically when you discovered it was just change and substitute of equipment that led to this. Yeah. Um, you know, it was multifold. We, it was spoken about that this was a supply chain driven decision. It was also a safety and security driven decision. We are building one of the largest domes in the world, and it was Asadi's recommendation. Asadi is the manufacturer. Uh, you know, they invented the technology. 1963. They have adhered to excellence for 60 plus years we built this ambitious project um, it was their recommendation to you know like another very large dome facility that had been completed within the past year add an additional air handler to add redundancy to protect this great asset uh, so when they recommended that we you know it was a, it was a very substantial expense but it was justified uh, it dovetailed with the supply chain issues created by our economy uh, now as well. So that was the justification for changing the, you know, from two to three. And it involved rotating them perpendicularly, um, as is the condition now. Uh, that condition was represented in the plans, the structural plans. The issue was that our structural plans were out of sync with the site plans. And we began correcting that as soon as it was brought to our attention. And then back to what Mr. Hastings pointed out, we simply didn't think it was an issue because there's structures all over you know, the, within the 30-foot setback. So it just didn't really even register to our team that there was, there was a problem. But when the problem was brought to our attention, you know, we've fielded it the best we could. And that brings us to here. Fair enough. Other questions? So, so I get a question. So you, you talk a lot about how the ordinances are so confusing. So that implies that, that how, how, how does that relate to this, the pro, how we got here on this one? Did we somehow, did that confuse us? And yeah, uh, well, in an ideal situation, uh, uh, the project team would have realized that the uh, that the structural plans were out of sync with the approved plans and before anything had been ordered, paid for, structured, we would have come to the city, we would have had a discussion about what's a structure, where is it located, what, what can we have in it, and we would have avoided this situation. But for a variety of reasons, that didn't happen here. 
Uh, I think they're all understandable. I think folks who are familiar with the construction process understand that uh, projects, especially of this size and magnitude, um, you make decisions uh, quickly and then you react. And, and here, as soon as it was apparent uh, that there was an issue, I think one of the first calls Craig made was, was to me after uh, Jeff had been, had some discussions with Michelle. Um, we had some discussions with staff about, is this a structure? Uh, and it's not, again, it's not clear from the ordinance whether this is a structure or not, because you look at what's, again, what's on the approved plans already was these um, paved surfaces and concrete. So I think it's, it's entirely reasonable for the applicant to have not had that foresight to go to the city staff ahead of time and had they gone to the staff we might have be having the same discussion about the interpretation of the ordinance and that it's that it's not clear there's no i'm not trying to cast any aspersions on the city at all or on what your ordinances say or what they don't say we just find ourselves in a position where it wasn't clear it's not clear today we've got these units that are necessary uh, for a variety of reasons and they're in place uh, and what is the equitable result in in those circumstances and that's exactly what this statute in, exists for is for the city to and the applicant to recognize that maybe we are not entirely compliant with the ordinance uh, through circumstances that were not uh, done in bad faith or with any kind of uh, malfeasance on anybody's part, but we find ourselves in this situation and equitably what's the right result. Other questions for the applicant? Yep. It's pertinent to, for the do it during the non during the public meeting. Yeah. Yeah. How does the concrete not count as part of the structure? Um, I think that the the main focus was about the HVAC units. I mean the um, definition. You could possibly make an argument about it. I think the main conversation has been about the HVAC units though. Um, they don't the they don't go any far, the concrete does not appear based off of this too doesn't appear like that goes any farther out than what the HVAC units in right. their overhang do right. so it is maybe spatially it takes up more but it's not impeding any farther than if I'm reviewing the yeah, plans right yeah, too yeah that's but, accurate but the overall conversation and issue identified has been that the HVAC unit was the issue and it is they're all together I don't think I don't know that the concrete would be there if the units would probably not probably not it's a foundation for the unit I am not a builder <laughs> so typically um, service things that are flat to the service are not considered structures such as your drive a drive pave a patio they're not structures so this, structures typically come up so this is about a large concrete pad, pad but this kind of leads me to another question now you um, you know I, I have to agree pavement patio you know flat you know obviously you're gonna have pavement to access the property so of course it's gonna go to the property edge to the road right. wherever I mean that's just common sense yeah. just like a fence usually sits on the property line or very near to it you know but I, I don't think those are considered structures by definition as I read it um, but I guess this leads to the question that he's now made me think of is were these cement pads altered due to the size of the HVA unit being substituted um, I think if we if you look at the structural plans that were presented by the dome manufacturer they are uh, larger than what was shown on the site plan 
and um, also because of um, just the orientation and the change of that equipment made that pad larger than what was shown previously. And then the other question is, as I'm looking at this, it you know it does look like it overhangs the cement pad uh, foot or so. Or just I guess on a picture, there's no real measurement here, yep. so it's just speculation. But I see that height-wise, it looks like it could be a couple feet or more off the ground. But obviously, this is unfinished work. What is yep. unfinished grade? I guess my question: When it's all finished, how far above the ground would that cement pad okay. be? I think as we look at the area, we're going to bring the grade up um, around that. I believe that the pad is um, about the same floor level as the, the dome on the inside. And if we look at the exposed concrete around the backside for the access way for us to clear snow, I think there's a foot of exposure there when it's all done. And is that? Maybe, maybe a little bit more than that. And yeah. is the backside exposed more than the front side? No, they're both about the same. On so that it's, because it, we because the I the um one of the the things here is that it's the dome the snow slides off so there's um we, we don't want snow to accumulate around against the base so it's in a snowstorm it's basically a constant snow removal process to move that away so we want to be able to have a situation where we can use that equipment and not damage the fabric of the dome so there is that exposure of the concrete and it's about it's the same on the front as it is in the back. So is there any kind of little wall to this, or is it just basically a flat, some that concrete pad? That is just a big pad. concrete block. Yeah, so there's no... There's no wall. It's, no, it's just no a foot thick or two concrete wall. block. That's okay. what that is. Yeah, so, you know, just envisioning this, it makes sense that it is just a cement pad. You know, you guys didn't, you know, put, make it a structure to be... You know, way up off the ground. I understand. You know, yeah, so I mean, it's high enough so that that duct work and all can work itself into the dome, um, and then it's high enough to give it some weather protection around that around that perimeter, so we can clear the snow and work off of that. Yeah. Okay, fair enough, Mr. Fredette. Question for the chair. Yes, sir. Reasonable, not outside of the scope, to ask what the remedy process is if this is not approved. Well, there's two uh, two two paths. So they, if if we deny it, correct, they can they can then spend a half a million dollars to go fix it or whatever it would take to go fix it, or they could take the city to court, take us to court. Thank you. There's a couple of other remedies. There's some other remedies. Uh, no, that's I'm just curious. I mean, I, I'm just thinking of I think the last equitable waiver we had was a porch that ended up in a setback, if I remember right. I, I'm just curious what is, and I don't need a, a dollars and cents. What is the remedy process? They did give a dollar and cents in their proposal, but a half a million. It would be uh, it would be catastrophic. I'll start by saying that uh, we've already inflated the structure. We have a foundation. Um, you can't remove your air pressure without bringing the entire dome down. So what happens if one of these units fails? That's why we got three. <laughs> so <laughs> if you take them down years. one at a time? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it would be so impractical so and infeasible. Did, so, uh, so to simplify yeah. it, so if you did beyond the, the practicality, so what would be the solution? T turning them, re but getting different units, it just kind of. Oh, I would imagine, I mean, some heads would explode, but I imagine I'm we'd fully have understand to. Uh, that. Fully we'd understand. have to purchase some new units. Um, reorient them, um, possibly chamber underneath to introduce air into the structure in that fashion. Um, you know, you're talking about a just a major redesign and overhaul of very expensive equipment uh, at the end and of the day. Was the dome inflated by the time this was realized? No, it was not. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hilton. I have, uh, if the concrete's not a structure, what makes the HVAC? Let me let me start right there. The city has not determined that the concrete's not a structure. The, 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 the applicant did. If we, you read the city's well, memo, now maybe they have unofficially, but I haven't seen it in the memo. It doesn't say that this concrete's we, not a structure. We specifically it? asked for that memo for the city to identify the specific violation that they were alleging occurred. 
So that was an opportunity for the staff to tell us whether they considered that concrete pad a structure or not, and they did not. I agree that they didn't explicitly lay that out, but that letter was generated at our request so we could come to you with the specificity as to what we were asking for. Um, I, I would note in this, this conversation about whether this is a structure or not, in my mind, is a little bit of a red herring. Your ordinance does say, uh, I'll read from it, a combination of materials to fo form a construction for use, occupancy, or ornamentation, whether installed on, above, or below the surface of land or water. If I read that definition, that means the concrete pads. I think it means the uh, the uh, paved surfaces. I think it means the bioretention facilities. I think under this definition of structure, all of those things fall within that definition. But that's not what's important here. Your ordinance says when it comes to defining the yard, it says an open space between the building and either the rear front or side lot line. Um, it does not define the yard with reference to structures. And if you, again, I'm putting myself in a, in a, what was the applicant possibly thinking? What was the city thinking when they approved this? I think it's reasonable to say that the city took this position about the concrete pads and the paved areas because they were considering this an open space. What is an open space as opposed to what is a, a structure? To read those two provisions together with the city's approval of a site plan, uh, what's, what's the reasonable interpretation? So I don't think it turns on whether this is a structure or not. I think it really turns on what's violating the open space here. Um, Specifically, what's violating the setback? Yes, but as I'm required right. in Table 5A1 and, of the right. ordinance. And the, and the other, the other uh, relevant feature here is under your ordinance, I was trying to find it here, I, I know it's here somewhere, is there's a de minimis rule that says uh, you can have an encroachment of up to 120 feet into the uh, 120 square feet within the yard areas without it being considered a violation. And I know this board has had some conversations about that in other contexts. But so each one of those encroachments is less than 120 square feet. Uh, in fact, it's not much more in total than 120 square feet. Okay, I don't want to debate our ordinances, but I say I would I would tell you that you're probably misapplying that. Since that's for a building like a like a, so, like a, but it, I don't think it's germane here. I mean, you really we're, we're really not really. I would it, you can talk if you wish, but I, I want to cut you off. But I really don't think we're going we're going to for the equitable waiver. I think that's you know what I'm saying. Yes, yes. I I was just pointing out that your ordinance is we not. We find many places in our ordinances they're not entirely to clear. clear. Correct, but I don't think that's what got us here. Mr. Hilton, are you all set? I would, yeah, these, um, my, my thinking on this is if, if the concrete's not, then the HVAC units are not. So you, but the city made that, a determination and you can have your different opinion. Right. But, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying is it, and because it's up in the air, it's not, it's literally up in the air. Yes. It's not touching the ground. Yeah. It's not in the, the the ground footprint close to, I mean. So so are you arguing that they don't even need an equitable waiver? Is that where you're trying to go? I mean, do you want to redefine this, where we're at tonight? Uh, I, I know. I, I understand that the, the customer or the, the applicant. applicant is trying to work with the city and the city's trying to work with the applicant and if whenever the equipment changes because of supply chain issues that you know we need to try and work together and that's a challenge on this and I understand um, just seems 
it seems hard for me to fathom that, that the concrete's not part of the structure and that the, the vent that's eight feet up in the air is the structure. Okay. Okay. That doesn't change what, what we have to decide tonight. I, well, Whether it is or isn't doesn't matter. I would say that this is a specific, this is very germane to the hardship issue. No hardship. Well. Thank you for the waiver. Okay. Sorry. I don't mean, it's just. That's fine. Okay. For other questions for the applicant? Um, Mr. Just, Jones. Just to kind of steer us back here. Um, so the structures here were designed to be a certain size. They were depicted on the plant inside that yard buffer area, setback, whatever you want to call it. Um, when the new units arrived, they were a little bit bigger. It wasn't really figured out until, you know, code enforcement got involved. Michelle did an on-site inspection um, because nobody thought they were structured because why would they? After all, you have asphalt parking spaces, you have light poles, you have outlet structures in your buyer retention areas. Um, so I, I get that. Um, you, you did point to the fact that we allow 120 square feet inside that setback. Um, I'm going to take that for a moment just as an aggregate. What is the precise square footage? of the concrete pad, all three combined, the concrete, inside the yard setback. Inside the yard setback. Yeah, you said it was not much more than 120. Not sure if you were only including the HVAC units yeah, there. Yeah, we were only okay. focused on the HVAC units. Yep. Um, well, we can stay on that for now. Um, I don't want to dive too much into what isn't isn't a structure. I don't, I don't really want to open that can of worms. <laughs> right. Yep. The HVAC unit. Understood. 210. 70 something apiece. 76 plus 77 plus 78. Yeah. A little more than that. 130 something. Okay. Further questions for the applicant? Final comments by the applicant. No, we, we appreciate your attention to, to this. I, I recognize that this is a very unusual circumstance. Again, I believe that the statute was written precisely to provide uh, relief for this type of situation uh, where there's no intent to uh, avoid a requirement that's clear and, and precise. In this case, the, the ordinance is not clear and precise. The circumstances are clearly unusual, going back to the fact that this was approved during, uh, during COVID uh, and supply chain issues. Uh, the fact that this is a significant project for the city of Summersworth uh, should not go unrecognized here. Uh, this is a significant, not only a private asset uh, for Mr. Riotto and his partners, but for the community as a, as a whole. And we've had uh, enormous success working with the city on this project. These types of projects are not easy to get approved, to get constructed. The city has worked with us every step of the way on this to make it happen, uh, recognizing uh, what an what uh, asset this will be to the community in a lot of ways. We're asking for this board to recognize the equities of this particular situation and grant us the relief so we can go to the planning board and uh, continue to work through the process. Okay, thank you very much. That I'll close the public hearing. Uh, there is, there's no, is there any regional impact on this? I don't think there is one. Right? Yeah, there you is. still need to make a determination. Still need to do regional impact. All right, I don't see there's any regional impact. Does anyone see it? There's a regional impact. Nope. Second. Okay. So, uh, Chair, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion yep. that it does not have regional impact. Okay, motion that. Variance request by RH Simmersworth CD, CD LLC. Does you're on the, the that regional impact. Did I get the right one? I got the wrong, on the wrong one. application. Sorry. <laughs> got too many papers. Sorry, someone else read it right. <clears throat> Mr. Brooks. I move that the equitable waiver of request for New England Sports Hub and Event Center LLC does not have potential for regional impact. We have a second. Second by Mr. Hilton. Okay, so we have a wait, we have a motion that it does not have any regional impact. We have a second. All those in, any discussion on the motion? No discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, not a regional impact. Discussion on the equitable waiver. Mr. Brooks. So 
I definitely don't want to consider the cement a structure because it's only one material, cement. And it says a combination of materials. Just my thought on that. Normally it would sit flat. You know, obviously it has to have a little bump up so they can put a plow against it and remove the snow away from it without destroying a rather fragile dome that's really just a plastic fabric from my understanding. Um, you know, so I, I, I get where this is not a structure as far as the cement goes. But at the same time, the HVAC unit is made up of several materials. It's probably metal, aluminum, wiring, hose, piping, all, all kinds of different materials. So that becomes a structure. It's part of the use of the building. Without it, the building fails. So uh, that's how I read into that, just to back up how that was all decided. Obviously, these are critical to the building. You know, you need them to keep it inflated. You know, this took years of planning and going through all the red tape of government that it is. It takes time. It makes perfect sense that something would have been discontinued and you need a new product or you guys are pushing the limit, making bigger than anybody else because that's always the best thing when you say, I've got the biggest. You know, it's a selling point. So, you know, I, I get that too. And now we need three. They all are pretty equally encroaching it simply because it's a different product than what initially was planned. So I, I see how this is just an honest mistake, which is all what the equitable waiver looks at. So as I see this, I feel it's an honest mistake, part of situation of a result of situations as they played out. And I will be in support of granting this. Okay. For discussion. Mr. Jones? Yeah, I mean, just going through the four criteria, maybe one question that I hadn't asked, but I have to assume that HVAC permits were pulled and granted by the code enforcement, which probably would have depicted the location of the units. Um, so at some point, an administrative from the town gave sign off on the location outside the planning board review for the change in the units. Um, so I have to assume that they didn't um, do it below board. Uh, with the installation of these units, especially given the use to the building. And then for criteria B, um, you know, there's no ignorance of the law if the definition of what can be in and outside that strip book seems to be a little, uh, a little wavy with some specific types of uh, pieces of the, of the project. And then for C, I definitely don't see any health hazard with a six-foot encroachment for the air handlers. Uh, and then D, at this point, everything's installed. I think the cost to correct would be egregious. So I would also be in support of granting the equitable waiver. Okay, fair discussion. I would also agree that it meets all five criteria. I've gone through it. I don't think that the, uh, the ordinances has really played into this. There's no, no, no one out there who does construction that doesn't know that there are setbacks and our, our criteria is very clear about the setbacks, it calls them setbacks. This isn't the only municipal that requires, that calls, I know one, one that calls the, the ge backup generator is a structure, and you can't have that in the setbacks. So it's not, it's not an unusual thing. A contractor would know that those things cannot be in the setbacks. So I think that's, that's kind of all the, all the conversation about how vague our, our ordinances are, unless they were trying to get around it or, or manipulate through it. It was an honest error. They made an honest error, and, that, and that's valid. They didn't identify that it, was in, that it really went into the setback, and the, into the setback. So it was identified by the, the planner, and so it is an honest error. And it meets the, so it meets the four criteria of an equitable waiver. So I would agree. I would, I would, I would go for it, Mr. Brooks. And obviously, the plan shows space for those back there. It's not like the wall is right up to that setback so obviously they were planning we don't have the original plans the approved plans yep. initially in front of us but you know obviously they had space for them for some sort of HVA, HVHC unit there <laughs> this one just turned out to be a little bit bigger so mm -hmm. for a discussion oh a motion Looking for a motion Mr. Hilton I'll make a motion that the the variance Equitable. Don't wait, wait, wait Forgive one. me. <laughs> After review of the application, the file, and all the information presented to the board, I feel that all the conditions have been satisfied because 
I move to request that the uh, New England Sports Hub and Event Center LLC for an equitable waiver to allow three HVAC units to remain in the rear setback be granted. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Second by Mr. Jones. Oh, yeah. Any discussion on motion? The motion is to approve the equitable waiver. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Passes 5 0. Yep, yeah, equitable waiver is granted. Good luck. All right, moving on to item three, three Bravo. RH, RAH Summers or CD LLC seeking a variance of section 19.20.C.3.I to allow a 150 square foot flag on a property located 192 Route 108 in the commercial slash industrial CI district, assessors map 62, lot 05, ZBA case 13, 2024. It's a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Ms. Crosley. Okay. So the applicant is seeking, as stated, the applicant is seeking a variance to allow for installation of a 10 by 15, 150 square foot flag. Um, typically, flags fall under the exempt signs um, as long, it, so the way that our ordinance reads is that it states exempt signs, the following types of signs may be erected without review and approval of the sign review committee, provided they comply with all other regulations of this chapter, except where specifically exempted and then it states flags emblems and insignia of any governmental agency or religious charitable public or nonprofit nonprofit organization provided that no single flag shall exceed 50 square feet in area and not no lot shall display more than three such flags so the applicant is seeking to allow for a larger than allowable flag uh, they received site plan approval in 2022 for the automobile sales facility. They were before you in 2023 for a variance to allow for additional an additional 24.78 square feet of freestanding sign and to allow for two freestanding signs, which the board approved. They have addressed the five variants. We are back to our variants. Um, five <laughs> questions, so criteria, so the board can take action on this application. Mr. Jones. Um, I have a conflict of interest. My cousin manages the dealership, and I'm friends with the owner, so I will recuse myself. Very well. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Crosley? I have a question. Mr. Brooks. Is there a height limit on flagpoles? Um, no, but they are... No, and they had applied for the, they're doing the 40 foot, no wait, 22 foot? I apologize. Is it 40 foot pole or? I do not have the uh, height. They are pole. doing Application a 40 tree. foot pole. That's from the 22 feet, feet from the trees. It's a 40 foot flagpole. Yeah. 40 foot flagpole. And that was addressed under? Give me two I believe they went and they had a minor field modification that addressed that and was approved back in for the poll size. So I believe that Mr. Brooks' question is, is, is there a lip, is there a requirement or an ordinance stipulation of how tall a, a flag pole can be? No, I don't believe so. The applicant, we only have now four members on the board. You have a choice to continue with the four members, understand that you need three votes to get a positive to grant the variance, or we could um, continue it to next meeting where we could have another member hopefully arrive and then we would have five members. So it's your choice whether to continue with four or to uh, delay it until next month when we hopefully will have five. Okay. Uh, educate me that is it one and done so if this is it is one and done back to the flagpole height that's usually a in reference to the size of the flag as a scale is how they do that uh, I understood the question um, if it's one and done then I guess I would uh, probably table it till next month okay we need, we need to uh, vote on that right or no, no um, yes yeah. so if he is formally requesting to have a full five member um, board then you would 
motion to continue the public hearing and application to the October 2nd meeting. October 2nd. So I'll, I'll make a motion that at the request of the applicant, we uh, postpone this, table this until. Continue. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Continue, continue it, proper words, to the October 2nd ZBA meeting. Okay. We have a second. Mr. Hilton. It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Right. Before we vote, I just want to make sure you have to know we, we may not come up with five members at the next meeting. I'm just want to, then you'll, but you'll have a choice then whether you want to continue or not continue. Okay. Okay, but I just want you know, let you know that. Can All you right. put the flag up now? Negative. <laughs> you, you like to break the rules. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a motion to continue it until the October second meeting. Discussion on the motion. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Motion passes. We'll continue it to the October 2nd meeting. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Sorry, you had to wait. All right. <laughs> We're going to move on to the next item on our agenda. Three, Charlie, land use regulation audit report. Ms. Crosley. Okay. So um, you were provided with a memo in your packet, which I can go over. If you want me to read the whole thing or just kind of overview? Overview, please. Okay. So as indicated, we, through grant funding, we did a zoning audit. This focused on housing and primarily what barriers our zoning ordinance and our other regulations have to providing more housing in Summersworth. So we worked with Stratford Regional Planning Commission, and this came after we worked with them for our housing master plan chapter. So through that audit report, they reviewed, and they also reviewed, um, in addition to ordinances, they reviewed all of your decisions that the zoning board has made in cases related to housing. So they went back a number of years looking at the different variances, special exceptions that were sought to allow for housing um, and decisions that the board made uh, if there was follow through for those applications as well. So the zoning audit, zoning audit provides a recommendation guide for the city to potentially pursue changes to the regulations in relation to housing. They provided a menu of options um, organized under the following subjects, ordinance and organization and zoning map changes, infill development and conversion of existing structures, diversify housing types, site plan and subdivision regulations, general recommendations and best practices. So they provide key approaches uh, identified for how sections of the zoning ordinance and the site or subdivision regulations could be revised to improve housing opportunities, connections to the master plan chapter that was completed, um, and then additional input was provided through this by board members and the mayor's housing task force also played a key role in helping create this document. I think we sent out a survey that to this board and other land use boards that your input was inputted into this. Um, they also utilized scenario modeling as part of the zoning audit process to see how such as like our current regulations, what could actually be developed or conforming, how many conforming or non-conforming lots we have. We have a lot of non-conforming lots to the current regulations. Really? <laughs> Shocking news to you all. I am sure that it is a surprise. Um, and so we, using this information, we are interested in pursuing a phase three of the um, housing opportunity planning grant, which is what funded this, and to potentially implement some of these suggested changes or explore ordinance changes through that process. What are some examples of the suggested changes? Um, some of the suggest, one of them is, so the form based codes that was recently adopted, that's still, that's an overlay. And so that is over the prior business district and residential, residential best, business, I'm tongue twisted over this. Um, so one of the suggestions is to remove those underlying districts and use the form based codes to be just the districts so that there's less confliction and more clarity for applicants, developers. Obviously, there's always going to be some confusion. We see that all the time, but this would provide 
a little less ambiguity. Another is looking at detached accessory dwelling units, which I think Anthony will touch upon likely with his report for the mayor's housing task force. Um, and then those are my main two that I can think of off the top of my head, but I can provide more if you're interested. We can also send out the report again for everyone. We didn't print for you all just because it's a lot of paper and we can though provide printed copies for anyone that's interested in having a paper copy. Questions from Ms. Wilson. So who's, who now has, you, so you, we're gonna go for another grant mm -hmm. and then who do we envision leading up that charge to, to then implement some of those findings or determine which of the findings should be implemented? Um, so I think it'll be kind of at a conjunction. Um, obviously our office directed by um, Director Mears will work on things that staff can work on through different various committees that are applicable. The Mayor's Housing Task Force is already looking at some of the items that were, I feel like I'm taking over Anthony's reporting. Um, <laughs> and um, they're already exploring some of the, the suggestions. Like I mentioned, the accessory, excuse me, yeah, accessory dwelling units, they're exploring how to revise that if it is something that the city is supportive of to revise that ordinance to allow for more flexibility in those options for housing. So will the, the um, we would work, we would potentially work with Stratford Regional Planning as well. So would the planning board kind of have the lead role in, in suggesting changes to, to implement those changes? They will have input. Um, we, so for, to use the accessory dwelling units ordinance right now, um, the mayor's housing task force <laughs> I'm really going to take all of Anthony's. Um, so they put together a draft, which then staff looked at and then staff brought to the planning board for their comment. Yep. So it will be a joint effort through various different boards, I think, to give, to make sure that what is being proposed for housing has lots of opportunity for the input and making sure that it is what is being wanted in like, Summersworth. Yep, end result. Yep. Right yep. End result. Yep. Other questions, Ms. Quills? So uh, one more. So it's a long process. Yeah. When when do we see that grant? When's that grant possibly getting? You know, I, I know you guys are working behind the scenes on some of the stuff anyway. Yeah. But when do we look like we might get more? Be able to get that grant and do the work to actually. I believe deadline for submittals in November. So probably 2025. Yeah. yeah. Um. So things that would require more intent, like more help in drafting would obviously in or looking at would go later on but there's stuff staff can work on with different committees and things like that okay very good thank you chairman i have a question oh, i'm sorry go ahead is there any um aim to lessen the amount of regulations instead of just add to um i like, think like, you know, dissolving base districts is laxing regulation well, that's well, that's why I'm asking that's part of what I'm asking but yeah, yeah. it's it's an even-handed evaluation of everything and who does the grant come from so the there's the housing opportunity planning the hop grants um, series by the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority and invest New Hampshire so they've done different phases of the grant which we've been able to benefit from we did the housing master plan chapter and then we did the zoning audit for phase one and two of the grant and then hoping to continue to build up off of that Sounds but like it comes from the state government yeah um, but yes we <laughs> obviously don't want to make things more complicated because more complicated makes our lives more complicated as well so the goal would ultimately to be something that's easy for everyone whether that actually always works out the way we think it's going to work out um it's hard to say say if that would be how it would the goal is not to make it harder <laughs> if, if i can chime in i think there's several people that in the discussions I've heard sitting on a couple different boards involved with this that are looking to simplify stuff so I th I think that's really the the bigger push also good simplify but right for summer's worth yeah basically. the challenge is always the uh, they say a thoroughbred built by committee is looks like a camel mm -hmm. 
I think you'll still see, obviously, the board won't well, stop nope. receiving applications. <laughs> well, that Mr. Hilton? Um, well, so, we All won't, right, we, um, thank we you won't for your work. not have you guys. We will still need you, probably. <laughs> yeah, it always, always has to be. Item 3 Delta is the Mayor ho Mayor's Housing Task Force Report. Mr. Jones. Yeah, so uh, teeing off kind of what Dana was explaining, um, we kind of took an initial stab at trying to allow detached accessory dwellings because a lot of um, units come to the board and a little hamstrung by the hardship criteria that it's a little difficult to approve those. Um, so we took a stab at saying, well, let's just allow them. Uh, the planning board didn't love that. Um, so I think if I'm correct, Dana, Michelle revised it to allow it in existing structures only, which would be a good relief at the zoning board level while still kind of striking a fine balance between uh, preventing multiple dwellings on a lot, which that detached ADU prohibition would, would prevent. What was uh, the planning stuff. board's... Um Current, why, why didn't they like it? Do you know I only know? have a secondhand take through Michelle. I didn't actually go to the meeting, but it, it seems like they didn't, they weren't exactly ecstatic about the idea. Uh, but, you know, I, I've got a lot of ideas. I would love it if the zoning board had, um, you know, any input that I'd love to take to the committee for specific ordinance changes that they'd be looking at, because um, I'm kind of doing a deeper dive through the entirety of the ordinance to look where things could be simplified. And then hopefully down the road, there'll be a broader discussion on the bigger picture stuff, such as what should our zoning map look like? Um, the SRPC big takeaway was that the audit report kind of revealed that we're pretty overzoned on the residential side of things. We've got like six residential zones, multiple business zones. So that kind of granular control is just kind of confusing to look through and it's not really um, protecting the interests of the city as well as it could be. Um, so part of that would be to dissolve the zoning in the downtown core and in favor of form-based codes. So instead of regulating uh, uses and setbacks, you're regulating the massing and the layout of structures, um, which which I think would help in, a, in an area where you have a lot of shared walls, um, you know, things are densest. So there, there's kind of a lot of other things um, in the pipeline, but those are kind of the points where we've started. We're mostly trying to figure out goals. Obviously, um, the mayor's appointment is, is two years at a time, so we're just kind of trying to figure out kind of a schedule with that. And then uh, we're letting the SRPC do kind of the heavy lifting for some of the really detailed, difficult changes, but obviously we're a city, we have resources, we can change rules in-house. Um, so like the ADU is an example of that. There's been a lot of discussion on uh, density being based rather than on lot size, because the R3 zone is a 97% non-conformity rate. There is 97%, yeah, R3 zone's rough. Um, every single person trying to do anything in here is gonna come here to us for uh, a variance for lot size frontage. It just, so, I mean, my solution, and there'll be public input on this, I'm not the only person uh, with a viewpoint here, would be to abolish the minimum lot size in favor of a density based more on something like parking or, um, you know, amenities and services, those kinds of things. Um, so there's, there's definitely a lot of steps here. Uh, it's not a small job to kind of rewrite, uh, especially, with, especially with when we want to start redrawing zone lines. That's, that tends to be to be difficult, but uh, there will be a lot of stages for public input. And again, yeah, the zoning board, if, if any of you guys have specific ordinances you have gripes with, um, definitely let me know. Yeah, I, I certainly do. I've being on this board with you on the Mayor's Housing Task Force and the Historic District Commission plays into this. I mean, even the zoning board, we see what, you know, people are fighting against, so to speak, by, by looking for variances and you know, something that uh, Mr. Goodwin's brought up, and I, I love the idea of it, is looking at, like, established neighborhoods. You know, like, everybody knows the hill. That's its own little neighborhood. Then you've got, you know, the brickyard down off of Buffumsville. You know, there, there's, like, these niche areas, zones, if you will, that already have a character. Rocky Hill Road would almost be its own. You know, it's a very rural area, very wooded you know, you, you can probably envision these yourself if you start looking around town, but I think that's one of the best things we should look at is basing the zones on what's already established, you know, and you could even use High Street as a corridor, 108 as a corridor for these zoning districts, and I think that's the direction we should head. If we like what we have here and don't want to change it too much, <laughs> look at what we have and build off of that. Um, you know, maybe there's places it should get changed significantly, but I'd caution on that. 
maybe you know but again this this is all part of the discussion you know there are right. there are places that should get changes absolutely um, but then there's other areas that we don't want to ruin because it's nice you know? yeah I, I think our kind of our first phase would be more <laughs> housekeeping items before we go into looking at sweeping zoning adjustments yeah. no I, I i get it and it's you know but but they all relate to each other exactly I, I, it's, that's that's it the is big an challenge here you know is and we've run into this through our discussions as well but um I definitely think simpler stuff, you know, we have 18 different zones now. It's, why do we need so many, you know? And I think with the form-based codes, we'd get away away from that because you start looking, like you said, at the sizing, the massing, the appearance of the buildings, not so much what's allowed here, what's not, because businesses evolve and, you know, they're not the same as they were 20, 40, even 80 years ago. You know, not the zoning's that old, but... You get my point. Further comments? Okay, thank you very much. Let's see, any other new business come before the board? Ms. Crosley. Um, kind of old business, but new business. And to segue off of all of that, and that input is important, the Natural Resource and Land Use Survey is still live until the 9th. So if anyone here hasn't taken it, please do and then share it with your family members get the input of people that maybe it's the ones that don't want to come to meetings or don't want to have their face in front of all of this but they still want to have their voice and we want to hear their voice so the survey is a great way for them to provide comments if you need a flyer we have some if you want to bring them home to your friends family all ages are welcome to take the survey too the if you have kids or anything like that too like getting their input is important too they're going to grow up here so please take the survey very good. Any other new business? Nope. Mr. Jones. Um, for the housing committee, we did end up setting on a regular monthly schedule. Um, are you interested in just be detailing the last meeting at every single zoning board meeting, or do you want more regular check-ins? Because there might be meetings where nothing happens. When you what, what you just detail when you feel that, that there's information to share with the board. Okay. So what you decide what you know. Fair enough. How it, as it goes. Anything else? All those uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Mr. Burdett, <laughs> Mr. Brooks, all in favor of adjourning, raise your right hand. 5-0, we are adjourned. <laughs> We're out of here.